is Chris Ku, and I chose the Philip Gustin's The Oracle. And the reason why I chose this piece was um, as an untrained artist, unable to afford art education because it's so expensive, I came to work at an art museum to be surrounded by artists and other beautiful artworks and just have conversation and build relations through the museum. And uh, this particular piece and artist has taught me as an artist to stay true to your vision because Philip Gustin was a well-established absolute expressionist, already successful there, but he abandoned all of that to paint what he felt was um, necessary or just staying true to his vision because he stated the only thing an artist has is freedom and that me as an artist I am constantly reminding myself that idea so yeah regardless of imagery I think it's just taught me to stay true to what's what's so exciting about this particular piece this particular piece um just how personal and um, the sense of rawness of this painting is just because um, if you learn a little bit more about Philip Gusson's background um, he had experienced a lot of uh, racial injustice as a Jewish person living in California and with that knowledge, you can see that visible here, the shoes representing the Jewish um, Holocaust, the hooded figures, this could be a self-portrait, um, and a light bulb, which are in a lot of his paintings, kind of always shining above as like a artist, like a person with ideas. So, um, so I hear you talk about discrimination. Mm. Is that a major factor as to why you relate to this particular artist? Uh, yes, I do, because I feel, especially in the art world, it's very, um, uh, there's a lot of elitism going on in the art world. Um, I don't think it's, you know, not everyone has an equal opportunity, and especially in fine art. And I want to encourage our visitors and other young artists to come see the show and feel empowered that they are can play in the game in the fine art world and have their voices heard. So yeah, I hope to you know influence the young artists that aren't able to afford education to still create paint with their freedom and hopefully change the world for the better. Are you painting? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. And any particular place where your work is can be seen? So uh, I don't have any website, but I think um, I haven't. <laughs> Saying this, but I have an Instagram that I can, I have a couple of my works shown there, and actually um, I used to have a lot of paintings, but a lot of it was gone because of a house fire that happened a couple months ago, and that's actually echoing the piece that I chose for Rothko. Um, but yeah, I have worked on paper online on Instagram. Yeah. Okay, let's get back to the fact that you are you are a guard here, and yeah. now you. have done some curating right. and it's on display yeah. uh, but essentially you are an artist yes. and uh, do you want to do you want to get to that level of where you come out of and you're seen hopefully yeah <laughs> definitely I don't want to yeah okay so this idea of you being a curator yes. and not a guard here at the Baltimore Museum of Art mm -hmm. how is it affecting you be a very first step of changing the art world to be universal, not just, you know, like New York City, London, and like, you know, Hong Kong, but anywhere. You'll be signing autographs soon. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully we'll do another interview in the future. <laughs> now, you know, I, I'm still trying to wrap around my head mm. what is involved in curating a piece like this. What did you do? Did you interesting a lot of the curators did tell us they usually start with a theme an idea but this was just completely new for everyone because we chose the artworks first and then try to come up with the theme afterwards and it just didn't work out so um, so we just purely focused on 
this is just guards picked up favorite pieces. So what did you physically do with this piece? You found it somewhere and brought it here? Uh, no, this, all of the pieces here are BMA's permanent collection. Right. Um, so, yeah, we, we went, we had our picks, we went to the storage space where they're stored, had some time, spent some time with it. That's about it. Yeah. And then you pulled it out, right. cleaned it up. Yeah. And so you're presenting it to the public as one who has curated, so to speak. Right. So you had help in cleaning it up, and if it was, if it, if it had blotches, did you get someone to help you with that? Uh, not really. A lot, a lot of the guards, uh, because we're so new to everything that happens in the back of the house, that we're just kind of observers. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really actually get to pick up oh, and do anything. Yeah. We're just kind of watching the step-by-step -step process of what goes on behind the wall. So you're having a two-step stage here. You're guarding and you're presenting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's quite interesting. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, nice. It's great talking to you. All right. Actually, I didn't think nothing of curating until this idea came into fruition. And I'm really thinking about it really hard. Like, I like it. I like the idea of turning something out of nothing, you know? Now, I'm looking at this work here. Mm -hmm. What was this before it became what it is? Before it became what it was, um, it was just pieces that I don't believe they have been out. Maybe, maybe a while back it, they came out, but... Um, before this, I was just looking for something to to represent my culture, Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans, Americans, and um, when the collection came up, uh, that they didn't have anything for me to choose from, I decided to use what we did have, and this is what I came up with, and I still was able to shine a light on Puerto Rico and all my Hispanics out there. All at the same time. Where did you find it? Where did they get this from? Oh, these were uh, in the Ancient American collection. So I, I looked, they gave us a chance to look through all the collection and see what we wanted to choose from. And this is what I found. Um, and I love sculpture, so this is what I came up with. So actually, what did you have to do? Um, we had to go on the, the catalog online for the collection at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And we had to choose like six pieces we wanted to use. and dwindle it down to three and just talk about it, look at the pieces and just reflect on what we thought about the pieces and this is what we came up with. So these pieces didn't look like this before? Oh no, they definitely did. Mm -hmm. They, they weren't quite together, but they definitely look just like this. So what does curating involve to make it look like this? Um, you just have to think about the pieces and where you want them and how you want them to look and everything that goes into making this curation look like it is. So that's what we did. We create. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to wrap this around my head. Uh, so you found these pieces. Did you have to clean them up? Or did oh, no, no, no. That's, no, that's not our job. Um, there's definitely people who do that. They take care of them. I, this centerpiece right here um, actually had a finger missing, and the people who uh, put this together actually had to do things to put the pieces back together and make it look like it was never damaged. And it's a lot of stuff that we learned about. We didn't really have hands-on on that aspect, but we definitely got to see and learn about the pieces that may have needed to be adjusted or may have to get fixed and stuff like that. So then in other words, then you, you picked this piece and you had an idea how you want to show it to the public? Is yes, that what yes. So if things were missing, you then consulted someone? Oh no, they, they have done that. This has been in the collection for a while, so they have fixed it or done whatever they had to do to make it so look Exactly, what was your role? Our role in this was to show you pieces that we really loved okay. and pieces that made us feel something. Okay. That's what we, that's our curated. <laughs> and what's the name of this piece? This piece is, I haven't really named it yet, but <laughs> it's for my people. <laughs> um, hello public, my name is Michael Jones. I'm here at the Garden Yard Show. The piece I've chosen is the Medusa door knocker, because I like dualities. It's a door knocker, but yet, it's a piece of, it's a, I've never, seen the, I've never seen the door knocker so big. It's a mighty big door knocker. And yet it's in the shape of the head of Medusa. So you think you have two stories, okay, door knocker, art, Medusa. There's a story there. Why, why did you particularly choose this? Well, I chose this piece because for nine years I 
I've been watching people coming trying to pull it off the wall. <laughs> and I'm the guy walking from the other side of the gallery saying, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> and they're scream, screaming at me and talking about my parents and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, look, look, we let you in the museum for free. Can you leave the art alone? So after nine years, an opportunity came, a most rich, devious opportunity called God in the Art. <laughs> sideways, put it in the case, and now it's elevated to another level where it's not just a doorknob. Michael, it has your name on it. It has my name on it. <laughs> but now it's like a shrine in the corner. <laughs> and you can leave flowers and you can pray to it because with this, it's a story of a poor woman that's been victim, victimized right from the beginning. her again by transforming from a beautiful woman with golden rocks to a monster with snakes that could turn into stone. But no, the story isn't over. Here comes some guy along with a sword and a shield named Theseus who chops off her head and then exploits her continually after death, post-mortem, by taking her head out of a sack and turning other people into stone. So can, can the sister get a break? And I said, well, I'm going to put the sister in a case and we can make it a teachable moment. <laughs> they need to have you walk around uh, the entire uh, campus explaining what you just said to me. It's okay. I'll break it, I'll break it down to them. Because it's not only the story of Medusa, it's the story of... It's the story of... is 97 years old. Can you have some respect for the art, please? Stop trying to tap, stop trying to tap on it, put your hat on it, and pull it off the wall. No, no, that's not what museums are for. It's for to elevate your consciousness. This thing is affecting your soul, Michael. Um, I think justice has been done. <laughs> At least for this one. <laughs> Well, how does it feel to be a curator? Um, I'm not sure yet. But I was amused to be able to flex that power in terms of decisions of presentation and the conditions of the presentation. You're going to do this again, aren't you? Um, if an opportunity exists, I would mind doing it a lot because there's other pieces here that have been maltreated and manhandled. And uh, they need to be... Uh, Is there a cultural context here I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from you? Oh, maltreated, <laughs> maligned, you know? <laughs> well, it, it, could, it could boil down to the fact that <laughs> I, I'm not from around here. <laughs> I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. And I spent an early life on a tiny farm in North Carolina. Okay. And then from the age of seven, uh, I called Boston home, which I real, I still do. Why am I in Baltimore? An opportunity for graduate school appeared in 1986, and I took it mm -hmm. and came here and I stayed a while. I left for a couple this of years. This is something that you were maligned, though. Um, well, art is a gentleman's and gentlewoman's sport, and it's fragile. And if you do, when you make things like um, pottery or furniture, clocks, door knockers, but then you put them in a museum, I think that sort of ups the game. And it depends on which side of the conversation you want to come from. The texture of it, how it's put together, but what does it say to you culturally? You did graduate school in what? Uh, graduated from the Hofburger School of Painting in 1988. So you are an artist? Yes. Grace Hardigan gave me a master's degree. Wow. So there, hey, there's Grace Hardigan painting right there. So it's a small world. Do you have any paintings of your own, Michael? Um, I 
have drawings for this case that's inside the current catalog, right? Over there. Mm -hmm. wow. So what are your ambitions besides this temporary garden the art? Um, in, in, in reference to what you have been treated in? Well, unlike some of the young people here, I'll be turning 63 in May, and I'll be going up to Boston for a couple of days, uh, turning 63, and it'll be um, 45 years since I graduated from the Boston Technical High School. So maybe I'll see some uh, classmates, but I'll definitely see my little brother who... So you, you're talking about... I haven't seen him in two years. You're talking about nostalgia. I'm talking about your future. My future. Um, I take photos all the time. I got my camera right here. Each new exhibit that comes in to me is like a new art class. And I'm so and like uh, Chris and Osma says, we spend time, we spend eight hours a day with the art. And I'm the guard that you see that's eventually walking around looking at all the labels because I want to know where is it from? Who made it? What is their culture? What, is, what am I supposed to learn from this piece? So anybody that comes to the BMA and doesn't talk to you is missing out greatly. Well, they're, they're missing out on a sharing. You know, I, I meet new people all the time. New people, good people. And that one person out of a thousand that I got to put on a, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, hand uh, right there, young fella. <laughs> you put your guard uniform on there. I got to put on my guard hat. Because <laughs> we're talking about 30 years of being a security guard. Why? With a master's degree. Well, to pay the rent. Consistent. Well, Michael, it's, it's always been a pleasure when I come by the BMA and see you. And it's even bigger pleasure now knowing that you have elevated <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not just a guy in a suit, but I'm a very, very strange guy in a suit. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>